This interview is part of the SSEA Circumnavigator Summit, sharing experiences of members who circumnavigated. All engaged in this project are volunteers providing information solely for entertainment and education purposes. SSCA may edit and publish the interviews in the SSCA Circumnavigation Summit in audio and video formats to benefit its membership and as a recruiting tool. SSCA and participants assume no responsibility for the accuracy or validity of information shared in these interviews. Opinions stated do not necessarily reflect those of the Seven Sea Cruising Association. Hello everybody and welcome to the SSCA Circumnavigators Summit. My name is Jackie Lee from Trimaran Sloopmoosh and I have the privilege to interview some of these special members who have completed a circumnavigation. Many volunteers at SSCA are working hard to make the organization new and fresh and relevant to our members. So we hope you will enjoy this new series. Many sailors wonder what it takes to make a circumnavigation and whether they could do it. We will be interviewing SSCA members who did it. Believe it or not, over 100 members sailed around the world just in between the period between 2001 and 2019. And bravo to them. You will have a chance to hear many varied types of sailors. Solo sailors, families, two to three year voyages, 20 plus years, international members, former SSCA board members, motor vessel owners, celebrities, and regular sailors just like us. So without further ado, let's get right to the interview. Okay, welcome everyone. Our guest is Anne Lloyd, who is a former board member of the SSCA, which only goes to show you that board members are out there cruising and doing it with us. Okay, she and her husband Jonathan did a circumnavigation on their sailing vessel, Sophia. All right, so Anne, welcome, and it's great to be talking with you. I'll start out. Okay, can you briefly tell us your background and how you got into sailing? Yeah, sure. So, um, I met my husband at uh, college, as you say, in the United States, and uh, I was studying law, and he was already in the British Army, and we, we met there, and uh, we did a little sailing there. I had previously raced dinghies in the sea, and he was more of a big boat yacht sailor. Uh, but uh, his father had a lovely uh, classic wooden yacht, so obviously that made him very attractive. And uh, we've been sailing ever since, first on his father's boat, then we had our own boat uh, after his father sold his boat, and, uh, and we bought Sophia in 2012 uh, with the view to sailing around the world. But uh, I've been sailing since I was 16, and... Uh, my husband claims greater experience because he's been sailing since he was six, which is slightly trying because I can't catch him up. <laughs> but uh, that's about it. Okay, so then when you got Sophia, then you did plan to do a circumnavigation at that point. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Even when we first met back in you know <coughs> the 70s, uh, we used to go to boat shows and we would and crawl over these boats that we had no possibility of affording and think, oh, this would be a great boat for sailing around the world. But it was always a half-baked kind of idea. It wasn't a real plan. And suddenly in 2012, uh, his, his elderly mother uh, had a stroke and was dying. And in fact, all our parents were, were then dead. And we realized that there was a moment in our lives where we could go off sailing full time. Our children were big, uh, in their 20s, sort of fled the nest, and uh, we decided uh, it was time we could do it before we got too old to do it ourselves. So it became a real plan in 2012, but it had always been an idea that we shared. And, okay, um, okay, that is great, that's great. 
Okay, you said uh, 2012 you decided. Is that the year that you actually started? And where did you start from? Uh, no, it's not the year we started. So 2012 we decided. So we had to sell our other boat. We had a 40-foot Jano, which was a perfectly nice boat, but we didn't think it was the right boat for sailing around the world. So we put that on the market to sell it, and we started looking for what we would call our you know, forever boat. Uh, and uh, we started looking seriously in the autumn of 2012, and, and we found it pretty quickly, actually. And uh, we found it in Holland, and we bought the boat in Holland, brought it back to England, did a lot of work on it, and uh, well, not a lot of work on it, but some work on it. And we set off in June 2014. Uh, that's our start date, 1st of June 2014. Okay, and where was the point that you started out from? Yeah, we started Southampton in England, which is the middle of the south coast, uh, where all the famous liners start from. That's just where we had the boat, and uh, that was our point of departure. Okay, great. Can you briefly describe the general route you took? Like, was it the kind of the milk run, or did you do some yeah. other things? Or? Yeah, Go it ahead. was pretty much the standard, the standard trip for a European. Uh, England through France, Spain and Portugal, down to the Canary Islands, across the Atlantic to the Caribbean, to Antigua. Then uh, a little bit of time in the Caribbean, not much, through the Panama Canal, Galapagos, across the South Pacific to New Zealand, Australia. Uh, and then across the Indian Ocean to South Africa and back up to the Caribbean. And it was after we returned and had circumnavigated, we, we, we did the northeast U.S. coast. Ah, uh, okay. North and south. Okay. Uh, and and then when we came back to England. Sorry. How many years did it take you to do the circumnavigation? Uh, well, the whole trip, which was the circumnavigation and two Atlantic crossings, took, took five years and a little bit. Um, could take a year out if you wanted to just call it circumnavigation, so four years for the circumnavigation. Okay. And what kind of boat is uh, Sophia? And you've already told us why you chose it, her, but uh, is it a certain model? Sophia's, is it a custom? Sophia's a, a Malo, M-A-L-O, uh, 42. It's made in Sweden. It's uh, very similar and often mistaken for a Halberg Rassi which uh, many people are familiar with. It's a heavy displacement, fairly solid, uh, Swedish-built cruising boat. Um, not particularly fast, but, you know, very sturdy. The reason we went from Marlow over Halberg Rassi, apart from that was what was for sale, was they have an aft cockpit, and, and we generally prefer the idea of an aft cockpit over a centre cockpit. Obviously, you don't get the great rear cabin, but for, for sailing purposes, we, we like to be at the aft end of the boat and uh, we found this one in Holland in fact we found two that were almost identical within 10 miles of each other and we chose this one and uh, we've been very happy with it okay great okay that's good that's good information for people that are maybe deciding what kind of boats to, to get your idea on why you chose what boat you did okay now we'll change the subject a little and do you remember when you heard about SSCA and where, why did you decide to join? Yeah, we, we first heard about the SSCA uh, in 2014. We were cruising down the coast of Portugal and Spain and we were actually doing a uh, very light, loose rally with the Ocean Cruising Club, which we're members of also. Uh, and uh, we met Ed and Sue Kelly. Now, Ed uh, is the current president of the SSCA, and he enthused uh, greatly about the SSCA, and, you know, we, we listened to him. We didn't do anything about it at that moment, but later on in our trip, um, with Ed's continual encouragement, we, we decided to join the SSCA as well, and, uh, and it's been good fun. Um, so we're a member of uh, several shore-based yacht clubs and both the SSCA and the OCC and uh, we've enjoyed them both and they, they bring different things to the party. I don't think people have to be a member of one or the other. It's quite, quite useful to be a member of both. Yes, okay, that's great. So you are people that like to be involved in those kinds of organizations and we certainly appreciate your volunteering and helping SSCA. Um, if, do you remember some kind of a story you can tell us uh, 
during your voyage that relates to SSCA? Like, did you meet a certain person that helped you out, or did you help some SSCAers, or did you um, get organ uh, get involved in some kind of GAM? Do you remember any kind of story? Well, I haven't actually been a member of the SSCA that long, only a, a couple of years, but uh, we met a lot of nice people uh, who were in the SSCA when we were cruising in the United States. Uh, lovely uh, cruising station hosts in uh, Reedville in the, in, in the Chesapeake, uh, who uh, are a delightful pair. Uh, and uh, obviously we did a lot with Ed and Sue, including I spent some time upside down under his boat helping him with his bent propeller shaft. Oh. But one of the funnier things about the SSCA was uh, well, I was on the board. I had to keep doing the board meetings you know, by telephone from all kinds of ridiculous places. And one of the memorable ones was I did it in the market. <laughs> Bermuda. In, in I the had to market. Stand in the marketplace because that, that was the only place I could get good enough Wi Fi to, to do the meeting. So I was moving around the marketplace in St. George's and Bermuda, trying to get a good signal and trying to avoid other people's noise. And then, of course, it started raining. So I'm there for like an hour and a half in the rain in the marketplace doing the SSCA meeting. Just an example of uh, you know what people will do for SSCA. Yeah, that's great. That's a good story. And uh, I hope you ended up with whatever vegetables and fish that you needed to after the, all of that. Yeah. Now off to another subject again. Uh, this one you may laugh a little about. How do you manage to sail in good weather conditions and to avoid most bad weather? Is it possible? And what's the worst weather story you've lived through? What advice can you give us? Well, basically, people often ask us about weather and did we have any storms, it's, uh, especially people who don't sail ask that a lot. Um, the answer is the route we took around the world, uh, or say the route you would take if you left from California west coast or, or from Florida and went through the Panama Canal if you were American, the route we took is, I always say, it's the sunshine tour. We're like professional golfers. We are traveling around the world in the right weather. You don't have to read many uh, cruising advice books before you realize that there are certain times to be in certain places and other times you shouldn't be in those places. So in terms of the trip, really, it was, you know, a sunshine tour. There was very, very little bad weather. Uh, we had a, maybe three bouts of what I would call serious bad weather, what I would call serious bad weather, anyway, in the whole trip. Uh, one was in the Caribbean Sea off Colombia, which was quite unpleasant, but actually quite a well-known area. Uh, one was traveling between North and South Island, New Zealand, which is famously unpleasant, uh, where the weather jumps up really quickly. And the final bump of quite unpleasant bad weather, which was, you know, rising gale, was in the approaches to the English Channel as we were returning home, which we thought was a bit rude, frankly. But uh, So we probably literally only had those three serious bits of bad weather, and only the Colombian one lasted more than 24 hours. Uh, the others were short-lived things. The way to find uh, yourself in nice weather is to follow the advice, to travel, travel in the oceans in the right seasons, you know, avoid cyclone and hurricane seasons, and um, obviously you have weather forecasting on board in some way or other, but when you're sailing across oceans, they, you have to look for bigger trends than, than passing weather systems, and so you go at the right time of year, and it really isn't a problem. Uh, and if you choose a good boat in the first place, you've got nothing to worry about anyway. Yes, okay, great. I'm sure a lot of people are, even the ones who, who do sail, they're always wondering about the, the weather kind of thing. So that's, that's reassuring for that. Now I remember you in the bulletin reading about your adventure on the approaches back to England. So for perhaps for some people that have joined after that bulletin or they didn't get to read that story, can you quickly recap what happened then? Well, are you t yeah. and we, uh, I think you're talking about the fact that we left the Azores Islands for England, which is about a 10-day trip, which uh, is about 1,000 miles, 1,100 miles. And it's funny because when you first start sailing, 100 miles is a long way. 
but when you have sailed around the world, we found that we think a thousand miles is quite a nice passage and nothing to be too worried about. <laughs> so uh, it's a funny how your appreciation changes. Uh, on that trip, one day north of the Azores, we were in Notum. We were in a thunderstorm and we were struck by lightning. Uh, so that did completely disable every system on the boat and we had to go back to the Azores. It was obviously a rather alarming experience, but um, even that wasn't terrible in the sense of terribly scary. It was just rather shocking, if you'll pardon the pun. We went back to the Azores and did, did some repairs and then set off again. But then when we were approaching England, we did have a, a gale in the Atlantic approaches, and that was a bit wearing after everything else. So, uh, Especially as we had limited navigation lights and no radios working and no autopilots and things like that. But uh, our trusty hydrovane, which we used all the way around the world, the self-steering gear, looked after us. Uh, so, yeah, we had a big finale to the voyage, but um, all things considered, it was fine. Yeah, that was a, a pretty uh, not really welcome, welcome home, but uh, great for you that you managed and got through that and... and that you had your hydrovane. Do you really recommend the hydrovanes? Uh, well, we certainly recommend, absolutely would recommend anyone would have, if they possibly could, right up there on top of our list of necessities uh, is a, a mechanical self-steering gear. Uh, a lot of people sail just using autopilots. Because, frankly, when you stand across oceans, nobody wants to steer the whole way. But we really recommend a manual system like Hydrovane or Monitor or uh, Wind Pilot, and there are others. I'm not saying Hydrovane is the best. We chose it for a number of reasons, but but uh, we use it the entire time. We almost never steer the boat when it's sailing now. It's rather <laughs> sad in that way. And uh, I wouldn't dream sailing off around the world without a system like that because electrical autopilots are enormous drain on, on power and we have met so many people who've had failures with them and then they're in crisis. Uh, we met three people in the Marquesa Islands who had broken three autopilots on the way from America to the Marquesas. They had spares on board but they actually broke three. Whereas our hydrovane has taken us around the world for five and a half years and all it needed once was a couple of bolts tightening up. <laughs> so we really, really would suggest anyone thinking about this would get a system like that. Okay, oh gosh, yes. I think that that is good advice and I'm sure a lot of people can benefit from that advice if they're planning to do a circumnav. Okay, how did you keep in touch with your family and friends? Now, um... It's not like uh, in the old, old days when the, before uh, email on board and that sort of thing. But I'm sure it's still some of a challenge, like you say, when you're trying to do your board meeting and running around for a Wi-Fi signal. But um, how did you take, how did you stay in touch and any advice for anyone starting a world voyage? Yeah, sure. Well, we had on board a high-frequency radio, SSB. Uh, with a Pactor modem so we could do emails through the trusty sail mail. Uh, a lot of uh, US members use Winlink, which I think is probably better than sail mail, actually. So that's a method of getting emails and, and weather forecasts. Um, frankly, it is good, and it's great that the upfront costs are you know, all in advance, and I would never be without if I was circumnavigating an HF radio. We had a lot of fun with that in terms of radio nets and talking to fellow sailors crossing oceans. But it actually uh, turned out to be a bit disappointing for communications in the second half of the trip. From Australia across the Indian Ocean, it was very, very difficult to get any kind of uh, further forecast in and emails out. And the South Atlantic from South Africa right up to within 500 miles of the Caribbean it was next to useless. So uh, if I was going again or someone was going, I would thoroughly recommend they probably bought a new system called Meridium Go for communications. As far as I see, people have a terrific time with that and uh, they get emails in and out, they get weather forecasts, so it's all extremely easy. And uh, it, you know, they 
cost about $750 to buy and there's an ongoing subscription issue. But uh, we found the radio packed on modem system let us down basically in the second half of the circumnavigation. We managed, but it became really hard work. In terms of family and friends, it was more a question of talking to them when we were in on land and we probably owned about 60 SIM cards over the time. We always buy a local SIM card and we get local data and uh, we use things like WhatsApp and email. Although, frankly, we, we don't spend much time talking to our family. We just send them an email saying we're about to leave to across the Pacific and you won't hear from us for three weeks and don't panic till five. But some people want to talk to family more often, so I would say the Iridium Go would be the way to go now. But I still love having an HF radio for talking to other cruisers on passage, but for communication it became unreliable. Yes, okay, yeah, I can understand that each of the different devices have a, a different merit for different purposes, so good to hear your good to hear your idea on all those different things. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, switching subjects again. Uh, another thing that people are always kind of worried about is stories of piracy and thievery involving sailors around the world. And we hear those a lot because they are newsworthy and they are actually quite rare. But they do tend to make people paranoid and fearful. Um, how did you deal with security, and did you have any issues? So we uh, were aware of it too. I guess the number one point is uh, you choose a route that doesn't take you to the real known hotspots, which are uh, the time we did it, which was East Africa and uh, the approaches to Suez, or uh, quite a lot of the North Indian Ocean, in fact. Uh, and also uh, Venezuela and that part of the Caribbean. There are other parts of the Caribbean that are tricky. Some Caribbean islands have a bad reputation. At the time we were there, St. Vincent, uh, we just simply didn't go there at all. Uh, since then, St. Lucia's had some problems. Uh, parts of the Far East can have issues. We, apart from choosing our route in that way and paying attention to noon site, which is a very good resource of thinking about things like this, we really didn't worry much about it after that. Uh, our precautions were minimal in that uh, we do not lock the cabin at night. We do not have a grid or guard on it, which some people do. Uh, we occasionally, uh, yes, we occasionally lock the dinghy to a... Uh, pontoon when we're leaving it, the wire that anybody who was a serious thief could take out in no time. And we didn't have any weapons. I read a lot online about people talking about whether they should take guns or several guns or mace or pepper spray and stuff. Uh, being British, we, we aren't allowed guns. We, we don't think of in terms of guns. Uh, my husband is an ex-infantry officer, so he's more than capable of using a gun. But it just didn't arise for us. We never, ever had any problems. We were never frightened of any approaching boats. We just never saw it. And we never felt worried by anything we did see. So I think the security fears are slightly overblown. As long as you don't go to the wrong parts of the world in the first place. Nothing you could give me would persuade me to go to the Horn of Africa and go up through... Suez, you know, Somalia's a crisis zone, the Yemen's in flames, Egypt's pretty messy. There are still people who want to finish their circumnavigation by going through Suez because it's a bit shorter, and I think they're out of their minds. But apart from that, it was not a worry for us. It really wasn't. And I don't think people should be put off by worries about security. Much more likely to be robbed at gunpoint on the streets of some of your own countries than, than you are when sailing. Yes, okay. It's very nice to hear that with reasonable, good common sense and judgment that most of us is very, very, very rare and somebody could be quite, quite unlucky or quite unwise to get in a bad situation. So I think that's 
it's very good that you mention all of those and, and you can allay some of the fears that people have around that sort of thing. Great, so thanks for that. How did many people also wonder, how do people going around the world sustain themselves financially? Um, what ways did you use and did you see any other cruisers using different ways that seemed to work for them? Yeah, so, well, as I mentioned, my husband was a, a career army officer, so one of the benefits of that is you get quite a nice pension. It doesn't make you rich, but it, it gives you uh, a nice, reasonable comfort level. So basically, we were living on his uh, military pension, and uh, we had a fixed, you know, amount of money, and we had to cut our cloth accordingly. We had a you know, great time, but we, we personally never in our home life or any other life spend much time eating out but that's not to say we don't you know go out for drinks in bars and you know etc but we don't do a lot of eating out but we we lived quite comfortably on his um, on his income uh, from his military pension uh, i do read a lot about people saying you know i want to go cruising now and i intend to work from my boat and i think in a large part of the world, that's probably quite difficult. Uh, we met a number of cruisers who were working from their boats in the Caribbean, say. You know, the wife was still doing some marvellous job uh, online, basically. But uh, in our experience, Wi-Fi is quite hard work in some parts of the world. Uh, in French Polynesia, if you want to make your Wi-Fi work, you have to sit on the post office steps. <laughs> and even then, it doesn't hardly work. Uh, in some places, other places that are quite remote, odd places like Fiji, the Wi-Fi is fabulous. Uh, in New Zealand, it's expensive. You know, Australia, it's patchy. In the Indian Ocean, it was largely non-existent. So I think if you're just cruising in the Caribbean or close to the United States or in the Bahamas, somewhere like that, it's probably okay. But I wouldn't like to try and keep up a job that relied on internet. Uh, cruising uh, beyond in the Pacific, but, but but maybe some people manage it. Maybe you're managing it. But as I say, uh, it's hard work getting internet access sometimes in in even quite developed countries. So um, it really depends where you're going and how much internet access you need. I'm sure for doing these interviews, you've had the same thing. Uh, so that's why I think many of the cruisers who are out there are in the. Uh, later parts of their lives uh, having you know either put some money aside or, or got pensions to live on that's much more relaxed you do see some young families out there young french families with small lovely blonde children skipping around but they look as though they're usually living on a complete shoestring uh, and we prefer to wait till we had a bit of money to do it okay great thank you for that answer Anne. And we will be hearing from other different kinds of cruisers, maybe the family that was <laughs> living on the shoestring or some of those that were doing uh, e-commerce on board. But uh, we'll, we'll hear different stories, and that's why it's good to get all these interviews and all different opinions. So, sure. I mean, uh, can I say something else about the financially? Uh, sure. One of the things uh, that is an issue financially is uh, even... And we do pretty much all our own maintenance. And when I say we, it's actually me. So that's kind of unusual. I, I, I'm the lady chief engineer. Mm. I do all the mechanical systems on board and all the mending of everything. And often help other cruisers too. Wow. But uh, we were a little surprised, even with 40, 50 years of sailing experience, we were a little surprised at how often the boat goes wrong and... Uh, perfectly nice working systems working one day and break the next and the cost of cruising in terms of boat maintenance is significant and rather greater than most people would realize um, I think so we had a lot of spares on board and things but you know we spent a lot of money on the boat in the five years even though it was an absolutely perfect ready marvelous boat with a lot of new systems on it when we started so people shouldn't underestimate the cost of keeping the boat going. I think it's, it's quite significant. Okay, good. Thank you for that. And bravo to you for being the 
the female mechanic and put her back together or you're the MacGyver. I don't know if people remember that series, but there was a television series about a guy named MacGyver who could just kind of put everything back together. So, hey, bravo to you, Anne. All right, uh, now, with hindsight, is there anything that you would do differently about your voyage? Well, I think um, we cancelled one sort of year segment of our voyage, which was Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and then across the Andaman Sea to Sri Lanka. Uh, we just decided we wanted to kind of start heading home, so we just cut the whole year out. And uh, I slightly regret not seeing that part of the world, but we could always visit by aeroplane. Um, you know, we had five years. Uh, we could easily spend seven, you know, or more if you loved an area. You could stay in one area for years and years. So um, I'd like to mentally plan a little more time for it, perhaps. That's one thing. And I would definitely have had the Iridium go uh, for communication. And the other thing I would have had is a, is a system thing. Is I would love to have had something like a what and see generator that generates electricity from movement in the water. I think that's a mm. terrific uh, piece of equipment. So th those three things, a little more time and not miss out Indonesia, Malaysia and Thailand and a couple of equipment issues. But other than that, we're, we're very happy with what we did and uh, enjoyed ourselves enormously. Wow, that's great. Congratulations to you. Okay, is there some story or something that highlights one of the phases of your voyage? Well, I think some of the highlights are we... Uh, traveling through the Panama Canal is amazing. I mean, it's a short, short thing, but it's absolutely amazing to see the Panama Canal uh, going through it. Yacht. That's, that's quite a small thing, really. Uh, the islands in the Pacific were very special. Uh, we really loved Tonga, Fiji, and perhaps most of all, Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a funny place, Vanuatu, but in Vanuatu, rather unwisely, perhaps you can stand on the rim of an erupting volcano and look down at the lava pool and watch glowing red rocks fly into the air. And I must say, that was an amazing life changing experience and was absolutely thrilling. Obviously with recent events in New Zealand it was really pretty stupid but we really loved it and so did everybody else who's ever seen it. It was probably one of the highlights of our voyage and almost worth crossing the world to see. It was absolutely amazing. So I would thoroughly recommend everyone went to Vanuatu but uh, perhaps they'll have to ask their parents for permission before they actually look at the volcano like we did uh, because it's quite clearly extremely madly dangerous thing to do but it was still wonderful <laughs> so that was one of our main highlights oh that's great we love Vanuatu also and agree completely and as long as you get local knowledge and find out what the volcano is up to in the last day or two and see what the volcanologists are saying about it I think you're right there's nothing more thrilling in your whole life to be able to stand on the rim of a volcano and see it erupting Okay, Anne, yeah. um, after your world circumnavigation, I think I understood that you're still sailing and, and you're still doing some cruising, and what are your future plans? Well, absolutely. I mean, we've actually completed the circumnavigation in Martinique, so we cruised up, up the east coast of the U.S. And then, and then south again, and then back across the Atlantic, but taking it as like describing our whole trip from home to home, uh, we got back in August last year, and we had uh, some significant repairs to do as a result of a lightning strike, but that's all fine now. And uh, this year, uh, we haven't done anything yet, but uh, when the summer comes around, we're going to uh, go off to Ireland, and it's the 300th anniversary of the Irish uh, Yacht Club in Cork, the Royal Cork Yacht Club, so that's a very fantastic Irish party. So we're going to spend this summer cruising in Ireland, and we might even circumnavigate Ireland. And then the following years, we got in mind to go to the Baltic Sea, Finland and Sweden and Denmark, which might be a couple of years, and and then also the west coast of Scotland. Uh, one of the things we realize is 
although we have sailed all the way around the world, some of the most beautiful cruising grounds in the world are right on our doorstep, like the west coast of Scotland or south coast of England or west coast of France or Baltic. You don't actually have to go all the way around the world to see beautiful places. We have them right here. And like we, we found the Bahamas absolutely stunning. And uh, we actually didn't have very high expectations of the Bahamas because we thought it would be super crowded and things, but it was absolutely lovely. <laughs> so, you know, you can find absolutely beautiful places to cruise right near your home. But that's what our plans are for the next you know, three or four or five years. And then we'll see. Okay, great. Oh, yes, it's wonderful to hear that you, you're you still enthusiastic about it and want to keep on sailing and visiting other places. And like, like many people, we tend to think about faraway places and don't think about our own home areas as some of the most beautiful places to visit. And I agree with you about the Bahamas. We had the same concept, oh, it's got to be right close to America and crowded and everything. But it was very lovely, as you say. Okay, thank you so much for everything so far. We have two parting questions. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience about anything, circumnavigation, anything uh, that you think might well, be Well, I think um, this is just about cruising, really. Uh, as I say, I do all the technical stuff on the boat. Uh, one of the things probably that made it enjoyable is that uh, I am reasonably confident and competent at dealing with most boat day-to-day -day things. I do call in you know, engineers sometimes. but uh, So I think it's a good idea to try and have some expert, one of you, to have some expertise. I mean, you will learn more anyway on, on your boat systems, engines and systems and batteries and things. Uh, and to equip your boat before you go with a lot of spare parts for all your systems. Uh, if you're in the middle of nowhere, you will often find someone who can help you with something if you have the right spare parts with you. So that, that, that's an important thing in terms of preparation. And uh, one of the big issues for cruisers, as you will know, is to be on top of the whole issue. It sounds kind of boring, but of the issue of power consumption. The balance between the amount of power you need to make your boat run and uh, your power supply, which might be wind generators or solar panels or, as I mentioned, what and seas. But that's important to get that right, because if you get the balance of that right and you know what you're doing in that respect, then you really will have a relatively straightforward time. But, you know, uh, you need to think about all that when you're preparing the boat then. Once you've got the whole power balance right, and you've got the spare parts and a bit of expertise, you can go on sailing around in circles for a long time and you reduce the stress. So uh, I think it's important. A bit of preparation is important. And... Um, and we were, you know, very content that we were reasonably self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency is part of the fun of cruising. But if you have a problem, there'll always be another cruiser who can help. After we were struck by lightning, we went back to the Azores. And uh, in our anchorage, well, that's one of the reasons we went back, there was a wonderful German friend uh, who was a former electronic engineer. And between my spare parts that I was carrying, and his remarkable supply of spare parts, we managed to get quite a lot of systems going again. He was carrying a spare refrigerator, which isn't very typical, but that was rather welcome. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I was carrying various things. So, you know, other cruisers will always help you if they can, but it's nice to, you know, do some preparation in advance. Well. Okay, thank you. I agree, I agree with that. One thing that we find about this life is that people are so helpful and so nice and surprising that they offer things to you and they offer to do things and they even uh, do some surprising surprising things and that's why we're out here and why we believe in this camaraderie of people and if I may ask how did you get your skills and your mechanical skills is that what you had you studied that before or did you get um, it along the well, way i did uh, the rya that's the royal yachting association diesel engine course but that's only a one day thing i just guess temperamentally i am one of those people who if something that doesn't work i will take it apart carefully and try and figure it out and put it back together again and I, that's basically how I've done it over the years you know I've got more and more 
comfortable things. I'm not frightened to take things apart. My husband's often saying, oh, you shouldn't do that. You should you should wait and get someone to do that. And I go, no, 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 I'm going to do this. And I fearlessly take it apart. Uh, I have broken plenty of things doing that in my time. Uh, I tend to take... I used to take things apart for what I call, you know, preventative maintenance, or pumps or something, and I've kind of given up doing that because uh, sometimes you break things when you do that. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, some people say. But I think just don't be frightened of things. Just, you know, take it steadily, ask for advice, and, and you gather experience. And most of these things aren't, aren't that complicated, actually. Some things are quite complicated, and you just have to know the limits of your own ability and pay grade and, and be prepared to call in. <laughs> an expert sometimes but uh, as I say if you have the right parts with you for your boat then then all things are possible we had a Spanish mechanic who helped me with something once he didn't speak a word of English and I didn't speak in Spanish but I had the right seals you know, for a pump and so you were off um, so I think just just do it you know just 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 do it as Nike says and uh, you'll be fine or someone will help you if you become unfine just yeah. keep organized where you put the various screws that's a secret Lots of little boxes. Okay, and that that is so encouraging, and I think many women will find uh, inspiration and encouragement in that. Uh, we do tend to be kind of frightened and sort of things, but just uh, do it, and little by little, you're going to learn more and more and become more confident. So that's really great. And then the last, are there any other parting words of wisdom or anything that you have to say in this interview? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, circumnavigating around the world is more of a traveling experience than a sailing experience. You, uh, you see all these wonderful new places. Uh, you know, you do see gorgeous islands with, you know, white sand beaches and swaying palm trees and things. But the best... The best thing is both the people you meet in these new countries, different cultures, like the islands of the Marquesas or Fiji or Tonga or Vanuatu, the, the, the new cultures. But the, and one of the other best things is, is the other cruisers. Um, I think it's like a family or a village traveling around the world and the friends you make out cruising in the remoter parts of the world will be friends for life. You may not see them that often. But you, you feel an affinity with them that you don't find uh, back at home and probably never will. So the best thing about cruising is the people. Uh, it's not about the sailing, really. It's about the people you meet, both on land and the other cruisers. And that that is probably what we'll take from it uh, in the long term. And um, I absolutely recommend people give it a go. Uh, I have very few people regret it. It's not for everybody. Some people are not happy and they have to admit it if they're not. But, you know, if you're enjoying yourselves, um, you will have a wonderful time, especially with the other people. That's wonderful, Anne. I, I agree completely that even with all the beautiful sights and everything, most all of us just remember the relationships and all the great people we meet, and it just gives you uh, a better positive feeling about mankind in general and how the things that we share, not the things that we don't share or we differ in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't put it better myself. So that's wonderful. I think um, this has been a marvelous interview, and and I thank you so much. You've been very insightful. You've given very nice answers about your own experiences, and you've given uh, advice to people that are contemplating maybe a little bit leery or afraid or what oh, am I going to do if uh, can I do a circumnavigation and you've done so much in enriching this uh, interview and people's knowledge about things and I thank you very much for your time and happy cruising in uh, in all those places close to you, Scotland and Ireland, and be sure to enjoy the Irish parties. Thank you, Anne. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this interview, make sure to listen to our other guests in the series. Subscribe to SSA YouTube channel 
access the MP3 audio recording on SSEA website. Get the scoop on the latest SSEA activities and benefits. Read the latest Cruiser Bulletin. Participate in the forum and Facebook group. And please, promote our organization to who you think might benefit. <music>